You're muted, Eric. How about now? No, 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 no. I think we can hear you, 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 you. You're echoing with two computers. Okay, how about now? Somebody say something so I can set my Good. Okay, that's good. All right, cool. So I'm gonna leave this other one going. So sorry you get two uh, two views of my beautiful bald head. But, oh. uh, so I'm gonna leave this other computer. This computer is gonna be running because it's recording on it. So I don't want to lose that recording. Okay, so let's see. Da -da -da. We have uh, Mr. Sands. Yep. So you are now, so let me go up here and I'm going to take it away from Alex and give it to you. All right, take her away, sir. There's COVID. <clears throat> You're still muted, Kobe. Yeah, I'm trying to share my thing here. Oh, you got a Mac or a regular? It's a Chromebook. Oh, I see. Hmm. Oh, that's squat about him. <clears throat> okay. okay, here we go. Hang on. All righty, um, can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. So I'm Kobe, and, and I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about geothermal energy and how they are used in building systems today. Um, I've really looked into it like the past few years, and I find like geothermal heat pumps stuff to be very interesting. So I just want to do my presentation on that. So first, before we talk about how it's used in buildings, it's a good idea to just discuss in general what is geothermal energy exactly and geothermal energy is renewable energy that is basically stored and generate from deep underground um, for, to be more exact it's heat energy from underground um, particularly like near the mantle and the core like you know how they different you have the different structures of the earth and it's just energy that's collected from underground deep underground near the core and mantle um it's much more reliable and cost efficient versus uh, it's much more reliable and cost efficient method of extracting energy compared to other um, energy sources like wind or water or even just conventional energy that most people use. And it's used in many applications today, such as heating and water even. So how does it work? Um, as you can see by the diagram here, basically, um, Cool water is injected to the ground, or or it already collects the groundwater that is underground, and then it basically pumps up this water or energy from underground and heats it up, and then it's used to produce steam here as you in the generators you can see there. Um, here are some more diagrams of power plants. Um, some of them have slightly different processes, but it's all basically the same same idea. Kind of the brief background on it. Um, it's been used for many years um, and as early as the third century BC um, in China, they used to use like hot spring pools for bathing or for keeping their heating, uh, for keeping their floors and ground heated. This is, this is considered probably the earliest known use of geothermal power, but there are records of it being used in probably some biblical times too. 
the oldest heating district in the world was used in France, which has been around since the late 15th century. And the earliest industrial extraction began around 1827 with um, in Italy, where they used geyser stream to extract boric acid from volcanic material that's found there. And the first known building in the world was the La Grande or Hot Lake Hotel in Oregon, which I know has been in a few movies. Um, it was the first one to use geothermal heat. Um, some pictures of uh, hot springs, which is where a lot of places, especially like up in Arctic regions, Iceland, Greenland, they collect their geothermal power from there. You can see the steam coming up, so that means the water is very hot. So some of them are comfortable enough to actually go swimming in, but a lot of them are like literally boiling hot, 200 degrees. And there have been people who have been, there have been stupid people who have jumped in there and have gotten killed or seriously burned from it. So I don't recommend going swimming. <laughs> so how and what is it used for in buildings? Uh, as I said, as I mentioned, it's used in many applications, including heat pumps, HVAC systems, and water heaters. Um, and it's much more efficient than traditional HVAC systems and other, uh, other heating systems too, which I will touch on more in a little bit. So how the heat pump works, basically uh, it just runs on thermal energy from underground instead of from up in the air like most traditional systems use. It basically collects the moisture or water energy from underneath and it's, uh, it's sent to an, an extractor where it's the energy is turned into air and then it circulates energy throughout the building while it returns the air from inside back underground. Energy in most places it can be collected down to as deep as 400 feet underground where temperatures generally stay around the same temperature in most areas like you know outside of the air temperature fluctuates a lot as you go up into the atmosphere, but as you go underground, until you're around the mantle layer, temperatures usually stay the same, around 50 degrees or so. So the parts of the system are the outdoor heat pump, which um, is connected to fields and pipes that, which we use to pump the groundwater from underground, a series of duct work, which is run throughout the building again, and then two evaporators, one that collects the energy or one that distributes, uh, sends the energy, the energy around the building, and then one that collects the temp uh, the heat from inside and sends it back outside and underground. Um, here's another diagram for heat pumps. It's like a industrial setting right here. So you got multiple, got multiple heat pumps out here, and you see they all run on the same uh, generator system here. And another picture of how it runs in a home. Heating mode versus cooling mode. Um, most places, especially um, up north, they use it mostly for heating. And when the when it's used in the winter, the heating it's it absorbs moisture from underground, um, and it's sent into the evaporator inside where the where the water is evaporated and turned into air, and then it's sent into the vents system, which sends the warm air throughout the building, while it collects the sinking cold air to be condensed back in water and then it's returned back underground and then that water can basically be recirculated into air again. If you used it for air conditioning, this process is basically the other way around. Um, the warm air that is rising inside the building is collected from inside. It's stuck through the vents and it's sent into the system where it's again recirculated back in this cold air. Another picture of that. So there are different type of loops that are used or uh, sill barriers. Um, you have the horizontal loop, which if you're in a situation like out in the country where there's plenty of space, the sealed piping is buried in small trenches from about three to six feet deep. These usually aren't really the best ones because they're not super deep. Um, it's usually where as I said, if you're kind of out in the boonies or out in the middle of nowhere, that's probably the best option for that. So you don't have to go super deep. 
the vertical loop is the most common one. That's uh, where space is limited and the, uh, the pipes are dug in small holes ranging as deep as 400 feet. Um, as I've said before, the system collects energy from as deep as 400 feet. So it'd be best to dig as far down as you can so you get the most energy out of it as you can. If you're near a body of water like a lake or a pond or even a river, you can uh, use the lake or pond loop, which directly collects the water from that and use that in the system. And then a well water or open loop, which um, works the same way as a well. It just sends pipes down, uh, down underground and collects the water from there. If they're, it's like the water table is high, like in Florida, you can use that there. Um, open loop versus closed loop. So open loop systems, as I just said, it collects groundwater that is directly underneath. If, if the water table is super high, then you can just collect the waters directly underneath without digging super deep. So think of a well. Most systems though are closed loop where pipes and tubes are used to collect the water from deep underground, like up to 400 feet and it's pumped to the system. And this includes systems that are collected from a lake or pond nearby. Those are usually also closed loop, despite it being a body of water nearby. The closed loop systems are available in a variety of patterns, including just regular vertical or horizontal, which we see here. And uh, cool and cool, uh, lots of other cool patterns too, like the spiral or slinky, or just a deep trench or a two-way. Um, Another major difference that I found between these two are that open loops usually, they usually run only one way. Like it simply collects the energy from underground and sends it throughout the building, but it doesn't necessarily uh, collect any indoor conditions and recirculates it back to the ground. Whereas closed loop does recirculate much like a conventional system. So water heaters, water heaters are typically, are typically attached to the gates to HVAC system where they do share some of the same heat energy and some of the groundwater that is collected from the heat pump outside is sent to the water heater. And for a geothermal water heater, you have different layers of water inside. You have the cooler water, which is stored around the bottom of the tank and it's usually around 55 degrees. And towards the top layer, there's the warm water, which, which is warmed even further when when you go to your sink or whatever and you turn on the hot water and, and then the, the heat from the uh, heat extractor is sent in here and then it just the cooler water at the bottom is cooled further so it warms up the heat water at the top and standard temperature for hot water is usually 120 degrees but there's a some systems may have a thermostat for to adjust that um, another diagram Oh yeah, some systems do have two tanks. Sometimes there is a separate tank for preheated water, but typically there's only, you only have one tank for that. Um, as I've said, bottom layer, cold water and hot water at the top, the cold water at the bottom can be cooled down even further. Therm thermodynamics, which heats it up at the top. Basically how the heating cycle goes in the in the water heater as the water is heated up and it's sent to the receptacle of the sink or uh, water vapor which is formed by high pressure within the pipe system the plumbing gets returned to the tank and then it's cooled down and condensed again and the cycle continues as you can see it's a little more complicated than that actually but that's just the basics of it so compared to conventional systems and other it's far more efficient and both by cost and energy than regular ones, especially in areas of more extreme climates, um, particularly in Arctic regions like, as I've said, Iceland's a pretty popular country that's known for using geothermal energy. Um, you can reduce up to 75% on energy costs each month and save up to potentially up to 80% on energy usage compared to a standard conventional or a propane or 
oil run heat pumps. And you can spend an average of just under $2,000 annually on your, on your utility bills. Yeah, another bar chart that compares it to other types like uh, standard efficiency gas or propane, high efficiency gas, like see how inefficient they can be for heating, especially in geothermal, it's one of the most, it is one of the most efficient only to, only after a water furnace envision, which I'm not too familiar with that, with the water furnace envision, so if anybody else knows how it works, but it looks interesting. Um, this chart shows basically geothermal energy can be extracted anywhere, but it's probably, but in areas where it's orange or red here out west, it may not be as efficient just due to the arid climate and lack of groundwater, but it could affect, it could potentially be used anywhere because the energy is extracted from deep underground, but it just shows like the diagram of the different ground temperatures in the area and the availability of groundwater. In addition to being energy efficient, carbon uh, geothermal heat pumps are also also are very minimal in the carbon dioxide they emit compared to other types. Um, coal in particular it emits lots of carbon dioxide, so it's geothermal is not as bad on the atmosphere because it doesn't rely on the atmosphere for air. It usually extracts from underground. Typical costs, um, the costs have a wide variety of factors, but it can range anywhere from only about 10,000 to as much as 30,000, but typically you can expect to look around 23,000-ish for an average installation cost. Um, but I've said there are a variety of factors like whether you use an open loop system or a closed loop system or how deep you're digging the trenches or the availability of your groundwater or if there's another body of water nearby or just the general location or the local economy where you're at that can play into play too. Installation can take up to several weeks to complete depending on how deep you have to dig it, especially with larger commercial projects. Um, I know most geothermal heat pumps are probably used in like commercial buildings or industrial buildings. But all this will pay, it does pay off very soon. Like even if you spend that 30 grand on the heat pump, it will pay off uh, much quicker than a traditional system would. Like you spend just $2,000 on your utilities. A couple other things I thought were interesting. You can use geothermal power for swimming pools. Um, I know this is I think this is from a place like in Alaska or somewhere up in northern Canada where geothermal energy it's uh, basically collected from underground is sent to a pump system which is then uh, via a thermostat or a water heater it's used to heat up the water inside the pool so you can comfortably swim at that. Um, some pools may even be built directly from like a hot spring or another groundwater source where, uh, again, a thermostat is used to control the temperature of that so it's not too dangerous or go swimming in. People have also cooked uh, using geothermal energy like um, the stove or grill right here that was built from geothermal power that's just underneath the surface. Uh, I think I really thought this was interesting. Like, I can't tell what that is on there, but it really looks really interesting. And I know a lot of, and many third, uh, like less developed countries or in old times, they really used to cook the geothermal. So I really thought that was energy. That was interesting. All right. So to wrap it up, why would you build geothermal? It comes from a renewable natural resource, and that is the heat energy that is underneath the Earth's surface that has little has little effect on our atmosphere, and, and it's not limited like many other resources, and it uses it to advantage without intoxicating the air around it, um, help produce a cheaper, comfortable, and more sustainable way of living. The pros, it is 
again, by far one of the most efficient methods out there for heating and cooling. Um, it does pay off in the long run. And it, most people say it does do a pretty good job at maintaining a consistent temperature inside both day and night and all year long while running less often than a regular system would. It saves both water and electricity and it can last up to 50 years, much longer than a conventional HVAC system would potentially. Um, the cons, of course, it, it is very expensive and difficult to install. It can also be very time consuming. It's mostly used for commercial and industrial settings, especially like in factories or uh, power plants, um, as opposed to smaller buildings like your house, but it can be used for your house. Um, it's just mostly used for factories and stuff. It may not be as effective in some regions, um, depending on what the climate or how hilly or flat it may be in an area or what type of soil an area has. Your repairs and maintenance might be difficult um, if you ever come across, having to come across a parent it. And potentially anything from underneath the ground may also enter the system or anything that's underneath the underwater lake, it could also potentially enter the system which could mess it up and affect indoor air quality, but that's usually not an issue, so. Basically, I personally would definitely love to install geothermal energy. I think it's geothermal heat pump. I think it's very interesting how it works. And I think it would be very, a uh, much better option to a traditional HVAC system. So. I guess that about wraps it up. <laughs> Good, hey. questions, anybody? I was just going to say, you take this and marry it with the SIPs, you have a perfect house. Yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, I like that idea. The Envision uh, heater. The only difference is it uses two compressors, and that's mainly for homes that have like a heated floor and, uh, you know, want to have hot water at the same time. It's more expensive to install. But over time, it will save money, but only really if you have a heated floor and, you know, also need your hot water. And that was well, like, I said, like I said, it is used like mostly in commercial buildings or power plants. So that's <laughs> why that's why they have two evaporators. So it's large enough to send throughout the whole facility. Yeah, exactly. if you use it at home too, then it has the same setup basically, just on a much smaller scale. <laughs> Kobe, uh, I'm I'm most familiar with the sealed loop systems, and in that situation, you know, the fluid in the tubes is not exchanged at all with groundwater. You just have a conductive heat transfer between the the fluid that's in the tubes with the with the soil around the tubes. I'm really unfamiliar with these unsealed systems that actually use groundwater and bring groundwater through the house. Um, I'm wondering if, if you had any other information. That's the way it looked like you were presenting that was, uh, was that, the, that there was moisture from the ground that was then being brought through the house. I was just wondering if there was something, some, some more detail there, because I'm, I'm used to the idea of the thermal transfer happening from the ground to the <coughs> water in the pipes but not the idea of bringing groundwater through a house are, are you top are you talking about like the open loop system yeah the where you had an open loop system that you know the diagram i guess showed it going to a pond or going down to groundwater it's not as common um but i've read somewhere that uh they use it like in florida or some coastal location where like the water table is super high because you know if you like just look right underneath the ground. That's literally like just some groundwater right there. Like I know uh, my family who lives down in Florida, they've like tried digging underground and they like just came right across groundwater. That was like maybe 20 feet underground. So sure. that's where that come in. So you could use that there. Yeah, but I've, most I've seen ideas sealed up. So with, uh, yeah. you know, the, I've, I've seen ideas with our artesian wells that pump on their own. Uh, I'm, I'm imagining something like that, but 
I, I guess I was just interested with the idea that you could actually um, create a loop inside the house with the, the moisture from the ground, the ground water itself. I'd not, I'm not familiar with that. Is there a, any other considerations you'd have to take into account for that? Um, like your, your intakes on that? I guess your last slide showed a con of bringing uh, outdoor pollutants in with the water. Um, water pollutants or any decaying material that might be underground, but that's I'm, usually not. That's just what, something. Somewhere. Did you see anything, any, any sort of details on systems like that as far as their intake and, you know, kind of considerations you have to do with that system? In the open loop? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm just really intrigued by that idea, I guess, because I've, I've done a lot of sealed <laughs> systems where, you know, it's just like a outdoor heat exchanger on a heat pump. You're just exchanging the heat between the fluid and the ground not actually bringing the well, moisture from outside into the house. I would think it would probably be a little easier to install actually than a traditional sealed system because if the water is just right there, you don't have to dig super deep. Um, I think that's usually pump? on the cheaper side of installing it too. I'm imagining that most of the time you'd still need to have a pump or something that was siphoning or right. bringing bringing groundwater up and into your piping systems. Just think of how well it works. You know, you take the bucket underground and it just collects water, then it sends it back up. It's basically kind of the same idea there. It just- Yeah, I, I would have familiar pump, with that idea. You have a pump that just goes straight, or I not wanna, a pump. I wanna tube. interject in here. I wanna, I wanna share something with you. So if you've ever been to Old Faithful, there's a hotel right beside of Old Faithful. I mean, that's there's Old Faithful, and there's the hotel. And this hotel is completely and totally heated by underground water. So that underground water is coming into the hotel, and they have a radiant floor system, and they're using this same water <clears throat> in the floor as it passes back and forth. Now, the hot water that they use for showers and so forth is a closed loop system where they're pulling this water into a heat exchanger uh, for fresh water that's coming in. And then they take the heat out of this water and put it into the shower water. So this water doesn't actually touch anybody, but this does go underneath here. The, this water actually travels underneath the, the floor here for this hotel. And a lot of the houses around here are also doing the same thing. They don't have to go very deep to extract this because the crust here is very, very thin and they can actually use the water. Now, this water has high, you know, like you say, contaminants. When I'm thinking contaminants, I'm thinking high mineral content. So if you have any kind of, uh, uh, you know, copper pipes or anything like that, then, you know, you're gonna have some, some decay in there very quickly. Uh, sulfur is enormously high in this. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park at all, I mean, you cross over the gates and immediately smell sulfur, just huge, huge amounts of sulfur. So um, th that would be a, an open loop system. Uh, now, using it in Florida, I don't know how we're going to get hot water from Florida, groundwater. You could use it as a cooling system. Uh, but I, I, I haven't seen that and I'm not familiar with that at all. Uh, one thing about his... Uh, that all connected to the same... What's that? System. All that is connected to the same system across the different buildings? Yes. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Now, Yellowstone, now, uh, you know, all of this is connected. But now when you get out here and these are not connect these probably are still connected they may not be to the same pump system they may have a separate pump system on each of these these are uh, uh some of these are residential houses for uh workers uh that uh, you know rangers and so forth like that that are there and i don't know that they're on the same system that the hotel is i would say that they have their own pump but it all comes from that same source though Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, this is, you know, and if you ever go to Yellowstone, man, there's just geysers upon geysers upon geysers upon uh, hot springs everywhere. 
Uh, let me see something. Yellow stone. Uh, I don't know if this is going to show me anything. Let's see. Uh, changing those names again. Yeah, I had a, a really high mineral content in my well and had to replace all the copper piping with PEX. Yeah. Yeah. So here's Yellowstone, and these are all hot springs. That So, you know, Yellowstone is a caldera, which is a, the, you know, it's the world's largest volca volcano. Uh, so, uh, no, I didn't spell that right. Uh, so, well, maybe that was the geyser map. I don't know. But anyway, I mean, so in this little area here, uh, there's just tons of different places. And so there's that caldera boundary. So this is the mouth of the volcano there. And even outside of it, you've got Mammoth Hot Springs is enormous. Uh, ab I mean, that's, you know, why do they call it Mammoth, for God's sake? Uh, so it's, it's, it's huge and stinks. Oh my God, does it stink that you know, all of this is sulfur deposits that you're seeing there, sulfur and, and, and other types of minerals. Uh, but I mean, this thing is enormous. So, and it's, it's really cool. If you haven't ever been out there, you need to go. It's, it is, uh, an eye opening, uh, event for sure. Uh, what I wanted to go back to on this a minute. So uh, let's say that we're using a, uh, a a closed loop system. Like Danny was saying, what we have is we have gases that go through here for an HVAC system. Let me go back. I think I've seen it. Yeah. So we have this, uh, you know, like we have in a regular home that has an, a heat pump. We have gases that, uh, that run to an external uh, pump. And they, they either in the summertime, they dump uh, heat energy into the air. And in the wintertime, they extract heat energy out of the air. So, you know, like uh, Sunday morning, or excuse me, Monday morning, it's supposed to be super cold. I mean, you know, uh, well diggers ass cold. Uh, so there, you know, the heat pump, there's after you get down to a certain temperature, you can't extract any more heat out of the air because there's just none there. It's all frozen. So you, that's why you don't see heat pumps in the north. So uh, if we had a geothermal system, then, you know, after we get so deep in the ground, the ground stays a constant 50 degrees, then we have heat energy in the ground and we can pull that heat energy out. Uh, and run it across some air, and then we can distribute the hot air through the building and, uh, and do it that way. So that's one of the reasons that this is, you know, uh, more energy efficient is because we're using a constant temperature of 50 degrees. In the summertime, the temperatures, you know, we don't turn the air conditioner on until it gets 70 plus, and the ground is cooler than uh, the air that's in the house. Well, in the wintertime, we're trying to extract heat molecule or heat energy out of the ground. And it's still a constant 50 degrees, which right now it's 49 degrees at my house outside. And it's, that's still warmer. Uh, and I would be able to extract more heat out of the ground than I would be out of the air at this point. So that's why these are, are most uh, best suited. Uh, again, water in a pond type situation, if you used a closed, loop system in a pond loop, this water down deep is going to stay a constant temperature. And, but you wouldn't want to have it real close. So water, you know, you, what's that? Said even though the water at the top may be frozen in the winter? Yep. Yep. I mean, that's how fish still, uh, you know, they, they live because this water down here is still uh, some, it, it's not frozen, you know. So we're, even up in Canada, when they, you know, some of these, uh, ponds and, and lakes up there, they freeze over completely where you can drive a, a concrete truck out on them. Uh, you were talking, you know, uh, three to four feet of, of ice, but underneath it, you know, after the further, the deeper you get, uh, of course, it's, you know, at some point 
it, it I, don't, I don't know what it is. I, I know in ground it's 50 degrees plus or minus. In, in water, you get so deep and it gets colder, uh, but it never reaches freezing. So I don't know what that temperature is, but at a certain depth, it is constant. Oh, question. Uh, what's the diameter traditionally of those coils under the ground? <clears throat> The ones I've seen are usually about a two inch, one and a half inch to two inch pipe. And you got two pipes that go all the way down and have a, a very special connector at the bottom. They get you know, welded together, you know, plastic welded together so that there's not a, a seam to bust way down at the bottom. Yeah, I read about uh, usually about plus or minus two inches, maybe up to four inches, so. Mm -hmm. And what material are they using? Um, usually just uh, sealed. I mean, is it plastic sealed. or metal or what? Mm, just depends. Usually it's plastic, I think. Just regular. Okay. Plastic. Yeah, the water, geothermal water furnace system, they've used this really high impact ABS plastic that you know, is supposed to deal with any vibrations that might rub against rocks or anything like that? Yeah, I build a dog kennel with a heated floor and we use the, uh, the high test. It worked well. Kobe, what's the lifespan of these systems? Do you know? <clears throat> um, typically they can, I've heard of systems that can probably last up to 50 years, but most of them don't really last that long. They, it could probably last maybe before you have the before it starts breaking down and requires major maintenance. I'd say probably around twenty five years ish, thirty years. Okay. Yeah, the contractor promised me thirty years. Usually, they come with like a thirty year warranty or something with it. So. Okay. Very good. Any other questions for Covey? Kobe, did you find any information about the tax credits available for this? I know that we've had a lot of different tax credits that have been available at different times and you know, what's what's available now to kind of cut down on your install costs. No, I have, I have not heard anything about that. <laughs> at some at one point, we had a, a very large tax credit for geothermal that would cover you know, almost a quarter of installation costs, I think. That would certainly be nice. <laughs> I've, I've seen some people take advantage of that too and kind of, you know, call their entire basement a mechanical closet just so they could write off part of that cost. Danny, uh, right here is, uh, if you go to uh, NC State, uh, the Clean Energy Technology Center, they have a system called Desire and you can go in and, and you can search different programs uh, in the state, uh, in the, you know, what tax credits you get from the federal they, this is a whole huge uh, database of information that uh, you just kind of got to go weed through it. Uh, some of the the um, some of the the searches are are nice; they come up very very good. Other ones you got to kind of dig a little bit deeper. So uh, this I'm familiar is... with having to dig on that website. I've I've spent some time there before. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean you can you can actually you know search it by state. Uh, federal and so forth. So uh, it's a really, really good uh, website if you've got the time to deal with that. I just One did other a anecdote is that I uh, had a client use the loops under his driveway so that his driveway would melt in the winter and <laughs> he wouldn't have to go out and shovel his snow. I thought that was a good one. I've seen that a lot, uh, actually, especially around uh, New York, Rochester, New York. I uh, just did a quick duck, duck, go search, and uh, here it says uh, the federal tax credit uh, allowed homeowners initially 30% of the amount they spent on purchasing and installing it. Uh, it currently stands at 26% throughout 21 and 22, and it's going to decrease, oh, it's going to decrease again in 2023. And they said you can fill out a form and you can declare it on your federal income taxes. Yeah. But Danny, how 
how long have you been working with geothermal heat pumps? I had a number of clients in Georgia, um, but that's, you know, it's really only, still only uh, a small percentage of the total number of homes. And, you know, in those situations, I was not doing any of the install. I was just working on homes that had those systems. In Georgia, and they were all closed loop? They were all closed loop, yeah, and mostly all vertical. Um, it just, it, it was easier to to run vertical piping. I had one client do a, a geothermal with a desuperheater loop, radiant floor, a solar hot water, and ran all of that through an on-demand gas water heater. It was like he had, you know, three different ways of heating his water in his house. It was a uh, belt suspenders and, <laughs> you know, extras. So. Yeah. Some people do use that, uh, energy for like radiant heating cooling too like keeping their uh driveways or sidewalks heated too so the snow melts i think eric was just talking about that yeah and that's why those you know having separate storage tanks and separate uh um condensers like brian mentioned it happens you know we you get one system for your radiant floor and one system to deal with your hot water and and, uh, you know, it, it ends up being a lot of equipment, but uh, like you said, that initial investment does pay off. And, you know, eventually you could even be making money on it by the time you've repaid your investment, you know. Right, yeah, the water heater does, and the, the HVAC system do share the same uh, heat source, though. Yeah, the D super heater loop. And, you're, you know, you got a thermal storage tank for that. Okay, good. Any last questions? All right, Mr. King, you are up. Let me go in here and find Covey and take his privileges away from him. Oh. <laughs> and give them to Mr. King. All right, sir, you are in charge. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I apologize up front. A crew is doing some utility work in front of my house. My dogs are not happy about it, so you may hear from them as well. All right. My name is Charles. I chose to do my uh, presentation on adobe as a sustainable building material. Um, adobe is an earthen material uh, found in select regions, usually uh, drier, hotter climates like the American Southwest. Um, and it's one of the older building materials used for permanent structures dating back to as, as much as 10,000 years old. Um, typically just made on a stone foundation and uh, in a uh, single wipe of low bearing wall. Um, then with timber logs run through the top course and either a thatched roof or a flat adobe mud roof and uh, predates kiln fired brick. And yeah, I'll get, I'll get into different formats that it was uh, used in. Okay, uh, adobe is a very low impact material. Um, traditionally, like I said, it didn't even use kilns. It's just uh, dried in the sun after um, after it's composed of uh, soil and straw, um, put into wooden forms and then set out to dry for a couple of days and it's good to go. Um, it's especially low impact in areas where you can find that soil right under your build site because if you need to excavate to get proper water mitigation away from your house. Uh, the cut can be used to make the brick that will go into the house. So it's a very low waste system. Uh, um, sorry, Rob, would you uh, close your design ideas tab on the right there make, so that it makes the window bigger? Yep, give me one second. 
it's hard for me to see. I got, is that better? So, yeah, that helps a little bit. You could hit slideshow too, and we'll only see the slide. Yeah, or F5, either one. Current slide. There we go. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. All right. Obviously, uh, nowadays they have uh, laboratories you can send your soil to to get it analyzed for moisture content and compressive strength and and uh, figure out what all's in it. But um, historically, you would just make a mixture uh, in, say, a mason jar, one third earth and two thirds water, and shake it until everything's evenly distributed and saturated. Let it sit overnight, and and the next morning after all the particulate is settled, you can get an idea of roughly the ratios of uh, different material that's in your soil. Um, ideally, you want about, for adobe building, about 15 to 25% clay, 10 to 30 silt, and above 50% fine sand. If, if you have too much clay, it's prone to excessive expansion and contraction, should uh, crack the brick, and if it doesn't have enough, then that sandy particulate tends to uh, make it crumbly not have very good compressive strength. And so you can see on this chart here, you want something between sandy loam and sandy clay. All right, here's an example of puddled adobe, which uh, is how things were historically done thousands of years ago before they had innovated um, wooden forms. Um, and that's, that's how simple the building technique was. They would just carry one basket at a time of, uh, of mud, essentially, and, and then use uh, wood and leather floats or trowels to shape it and polish it and make the finished structure. You know, just went on one basket at a time. And here's an example of more common adobe bricks. These would usually be uh, either eight by four by 12 or 10 by four by 14 for smaller bricks, um, anywhere from 25, 35 pounds a piece. Um, and specifically in American history, uh, the Puebloan culture used uh, puddled adobe until the Spanish colonial colonists came. And um, uh, they brought over wood forms and obviously they just, uh, you know, they, they didn't select adobe as a green building material. It was just what they had on hand. There wasn't sufficient timber or uh, lumber that was building grade and wasn't feasible to transport the materials they were accustomed to to, to the Southwest. So uh, adobe is what it was. And the cool thing about building with, mater uh, with adobe material is that there aren't a lot of different constituent components as far as the, the structure, it's not like you have to order different size bricks. You just, just like with concrete, you can um, mold it and adapt it any way you want to build a bigger form if you need bigger bricks and um, up, up to the size that it's feasible to move them. I've, I've read that uh, about the biggest that is common is about two feet across. And at that point, you're, you're getting into bricks that are about 100 pounds and it's not really feasible for we're building in the traditional sense anymore. Um, another noteworthy thing about adobe is that uh, the mortar to put the bricks together and the interior and exterior plaster finish is made from the very same mud that makes the adobe bricks. Uh, in the case of the mortar, that's uh, even to today, um, you still use mud plaster. Um, sorry, mud mortar, because cement mortar would be too hard. You don't want your mortar to be stronger than your bricks. And uh, in modern applications, the exterior pl uh, plaster would have um, asphalt emulsion or Portland cement added in to stop water intrusion. Um, historically, you would just reapply more plaster every couple of years. It was a, an ongoing thing to keep uh, keep the cracking to a minimum, keep the water intrusion down. <clears throat> and in between those two, uh, you have lime wash and whitewash, which people started to apply with uh, you know, gypsum powder and lime to try to uh, weatherproof their homes. 
another interesting thing about Adobe is despite it uh, being found all over the world in uh, indigenous communities, a lot of those build sites predate any communication between those civilizations. So it, it was just, uh, you know, that, that simple of an idea that everyone came up with it. You have on the left, uh, uh, an enormous mosque in Mali, in West Africa, and then uh, the Mesa Verde in California, I'm sorry, Colorado. And those two alone are over a thousand years old. And then uh, there's a mission in Mexico and a mission in Santa Fe that's pretty famous, but <clears throat> it can be found all over the world. Uh, the biggest uh, sustainability draw probably of using Adobe outside of how easy it is to work with is that it has a large thermal mass. Sorry, there we go. Um, being that the walls are so thick and, and traditionally single, single wide, uh, it takes a long time for the sun to be able to penetrate. Um, so there's a little bit of a delay buffer between the extreme temperatures of, of daytime and the cold temperatures of night. So by the time all that heat is soaked into the stone over the day, it's, it's nighttime and you have a radiant effect that helps keep your home warm. And the opposite effect goes into, uh, in a night, the cool air comes in through the uh, apertures and cools off the stone and you get the cooling effect throughout the day before the sun can warm things up again. And this is just another slide to um, demonstrate the longevity of uh, of Adobe structures. On the right is a structure called the oldest house. I don't know. If, uh, I hunted around a little bit. I couldn't find any documentation that it was actually the oldest um, inhabited house in the U.S., but it's from the 1640s, and it's been um, continuously occupied up until I want to say about 30 years ago when it was turned into a museum. And on the left is a, a Puebla uh, village in Taos um, that has been there for more than a thousand years. And outside of a little, you know, maintenance here and there and, and more plaster on the roof and on the walls, it's stood like that for that long. Um, again, this is what the backyard of an Adobe property would typically look like. That's why we don't see them very often around here. It works a lot better in dry and hot climates. And you'll see, uh, People adapt the building style in other climates, but it becomes less and less sustainable at that point because you're importing um, materials that can't be found in native soil cultures, and uh, you're having to do so much engineering to make the material hospitable to the climate that uh, it's kind of uh, diminishing returns. Uh, here's a climate table comparing a uh, Asheville, where I live, to Santa Fe, New Mexico. I just chose Santa Fe because that's a city that's famous for its uh, Adobe architecture. And though there are similar high temperatures, you can see there's a larger temperature disparity between the daytime and the nighttime. And that's what makes uh, Adobe so attractive is it can eliminate some of the extremes in temperature between day and night. So if you, uh, you're climate falls somewhere in the in the middle instead of at either extreme. And similarly, Santa Fe versus Asheville, obviously we get a lot more rain than that area of the world. Um, and precipitation totals tend to be similar in whatever countries Adobe architecture is popular in because it just sees more longevity uh, when it's not heavily treated in a drier, warmer places. In a, Modern application outside of uh, traditional hot, dry climates, you'll see people use a lot of asphalt emulsion in their plaster, um, having high foundations to try to keep keep uh, groundwater away from from the adobe brick, uh, large roof overhangs. So it, it can be done, but like I said, just diminishing returns trying to adapt it to a climate like ours.
Um, some drawbacks of building with Adobe, obviously it's a uh, very heavy material in compared to, to working with, uh, with say brick in larger Adobe bricks, commonly 60 to 80 pounds. And uh, has a lot of associated manpower with every stage from production to transportation to uh, building down the line. If there's demolition and remodeling, it, it's all heavy, hard work. So there's a lot of labor costs involved. Um, another drawback is the inaccessibility of the product. Um, should you try to build an Adobe structure in this area of the world, you're either going to have to source uh, um, sand, clay, silt from different mines in the area and compose the, the brick yourself um, in a more or less traditional fashion, or you're going to have to find somebody in the country, which is probably only going to be, you know, in the American Southwest to load up flatbeds and drive the material out to you. Uh, it's a pretty big associated fossil fuel cost. And uh, I read that an average Adobe house has about 5,000 bricks. So whether you're making them yourself or having them uh, transported to you, there's, there's a large carbon footprint and labor so uh, cost affiliated. And another drawback is the maintenance uh, associated with building with Adobe. Um, most of these points here, you don't need to read through individually, but they are mostly to do with water intrusion and uh, cracking of bricks over time. Um, whether you're replacing, repointing uh, mud mortar or having to uh, support walls and replace entire bricks or just uh, add to the plaster on the interior and exterior over time, there's a larger associated cost than with uh, more traditional engineered products. Um, adding insulation, it's another uh, roadblock a lot of people run into if they're trying to build a historic style uh, adobe home. Like I said, the walls are all load bearing and they're traditionally um, single wide. So there are no cavities for that or sprayed or blown insulation. Um, so in cases like that, you would have to um, add a laid structure on the outside and, and rigid insulation before you plaster. Or, um, which is, and, and this is also the case when you're working with utilities and having uh, things plumbed and wired in, you uh, adapt that building style to have a two wide wall with um, a filled center so you can run your utilities. Uh, there's a pretty large associated cost if you're having a home built for you in uh, trying to adapt the traditional style to uh, more modern engineering and code standards and finding tradesmen who are familiar with the uh, building technique to be able to work their trades around the obstacles that Adobe poses. And last drawback I could find, they're very earthquake prone. Um, by having a, having large clay content, which I mean, can help with minor cracking because the clay warms and becomes more malleable and can fill holes itself um, that form over time. But it is still a brittle building material and prone to failure in earthquakes. So uh, to rectify that, Modern engineering has people uh, reinforcing the plastic or rope grids on um, the outside of the brick and mortar structure before the plaster is applied. In uh, this case, you can see the, the rope binding on the right uh, roughly mimics the size of the adobe brick, so it's uh, helping to hold the, hold the mortar and brick in place and make everything a little bit more stable. And this would be in, in addition to um, in modern cases, when they have two wide thickness walls with a cavity uh, rebar and welded wire mesh reinforcements. Modern code also would stipulate that uh, there are heightened protections to the exterior plaster. Um, like I said, traditionally, um, 
cost and efficiency was valued more over longevity so people would you know go out every two to three years and add another coat of plaster onto their walls or their roof and, and keep the water off but it's a uh, more costly in the long run to add a stabilizer like a lime or asphalt emulsion to uh, increase the longevity of, of the structure. Um, yeah, I already more or less went over that. Just uh, water mitigation is one of the, the most important considerations when building with Adobe because uh, water damage or water infiltration in through the, the porous surface of uh, the adobe brick can lead, lead to rot or weaknesses or um, insect infestation. And it's so cumbersome to, uh, to remove brick and to, to rebuild that you have to be really cautious and make sure your foundations are high, your roof overhangs are, are good, and that your uh, plaster is without cracks and properly treated so that you don't run into those issues. I um I personally think Adobe is is a really aesthetically pleasing, really, really um, fundamentally attractive product. Um, it does have a lot of considerations to take into account. I don't think it would be a good idea to to build an Adobe home in this region. Um, it's just not what the material was intended for. It becomes less and less green and sustainable as you move farther away from the area of the world where it was. Uh, sort of bastion because necessary uh, cautions need to be taken to uh, make the material work. And at, at that point, your transportation and, and labor costs become so high that it's it's somewhat prohibitive. But in parts of the world where where it does work, it's some of the highest longevity uh, structures that you'll ever see. And uh, a very low environmental impact. And yeah, that's about all I got. Nice, questions? It doesn't seem like it'd be very stable if <clears throat> you wanted to build like a two-story, although in the West, I've seen them, the Native Americans did it. Uh, I'm just wondering if you could apply rebarb in that somehow like we do concrete. Yeah, I read that in a lot of uh, modern applications, they will leave a void in between two bricks and and fill with rebar and concrete. Um, but all the you know historical preservationists typically do not uh, advocate building more than two stories and they typically don't have a basement it's it's a one or two story structure essentially i i think i read that for every foot thickness of wall you can go 10 feet high so if you want to go higher than that you're talking about feet and feet of of wall thickness to make it stable <clears throat> and then to, bring to the top so what do they put in there for reinforcement what, I mean, is there anything mixed in with the soil? When they make the actual bricks, you mean? Yes. Um, well, historically, it would, it would just be clay, sand, and, and straw. So like straw or manure to stabilize. Um, and then it would sit in the, sit in the sun and, and dry out, and that's about it. But, but uh, in current application, I've read that asphalt emulsion is the most common thing to, to stabilize and stop water intrusion. OK. Okay. When you say straw, I want to, you know, a lot of times we think straw and grass are the same, but they're not. Straw is a hollow uh, reed type grass where grass is a blade, you know, it's so you can't actually put grass into it. Uh, and when we, you know, we think about sort of straw versus hay, uh, when you use the term straw, we, we have to, you know, we have to worry about it has to be, should be bar barley wheat, that kind of stuff, not grass. So when we think about hay, so don't get that confused there. Um, one thing I wanna, I wanna show, I was watching your presentation. I did a little, um, I did a little thing while you were there. So I was looking at the two charts that you had here. 
between Asheville and Santa Fe, and I wanted to put it in real time. So here is two inches of rain across through here. You you had this large size so we could see it, and it and I was thinking, wait a minute, surely they don't get four inches. And then it dawned on me that uh, you know, so let me. I'm not picking on you. I just <laughs> I just want to make sure that everyone is understanding. So I've got two inch of rainfall right there. So you know, Asheville is way above Santa Fe as far as rainfall is concerned. But not only, you know, rainfall, because Adobe being clay, clay is very, very thin, very small particles, and they are susceptible to water. So, you know, you were saying it wouldn't be a good idea to put it here. And that's true because of the amount of rain that we have for sure. But what else is bigger? And I did some research on this while you're, and I, I was listening, I, I was listening and you did a very good job. So here is, and I just pulled this up. Here is, look at this. This is the relative humidity of Asheville. Mm -hmm. All right. So the relative, even if it's not raining, you know, in January right now, February is between 60 and 56 percent. So that's how much moisture is in the air. I couldn't find Santa Fe, so I just went to Roswell. And look here. I mean, the maximum that it ever gets is 14. So mm -hmm. it's a very arid place. And so, you know, it, even if we tried to build it here, the moisture that's in our air here would disintegrate it. I mean, over time, it would just turn into to mud and we would be problematic, be very, very problematic. But mm -hmm. I agree, it's, I mean, you know, looking at your pictures, they are, you know, these, these structures are absolutely beautiful, you know. Um, and the stuff that you, this is probably my favorite right there, because you got a little bit of woodworking going on there, and you got a little bit of, of, of adobe and stuff going on there. What do you think these holes are here for? Ventilation. Drainage. Drainage. There you go. Water oh, drainage. drainage. Yeah. yeah. Water drainage. That's, that's, this is called a scupper, by the way. Mm -hmm. Scupper. Very cool. I like that. Looks good. Any other questions for for Charles? Well, again, we have run out of time, and uh, I do apologize for that. But uh, you know, what is the old saying? Uh, time flies when you're having fun. So uh, I hope everybody has a good one. And uh, we will uh, we'll meet again on Monday. Hope everybody has a good weekend. And uh, thanks, guys. I'll see you. Take care. See you Monday.